really is a good thing to be here together to prepare for this journey of Lent that we're going through. As you look up here at the chancel area, I'm sure you've noticed it looks a little bit different, and we will talk more about that on Sunday. But it will look this way in some form all the way through Lent as we go on this journey toward Easter. So as we prepare for our service tonight, let us open with a word of prayer. Our great and our glorious God, from the dust of the earth you formed us, and from the dust of dust of death you will rise raise us up we pray god that you would create in us clean hearts that you would give us a new spirit so that we may repent of our sin and live a life following you and following the calling that you've placed on each of us as we worship you tonight we pray that your spirit would be in this place that we will leave here empowered by you. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Now I'd invite you to stand if you're able and let us sing together, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Please be seated. Our first scripture reading for this evening comes from Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, Call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And our second reading for this evening comes from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4 and 23 and 24. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening. Get up here. You guys did a nice job sitting together. You know, I'm proud of you. <clears throat> I have one more scripture text to lift up here tonight, and this is from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 15 through 18, and I didn't tell Mike, so he doesn't have it on the screen. But in this text, it's Moses speaking to the Israelites, and Moses is reminding the Israelites of their great sin. So I turned and went down from the mountain while it was ablaze with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord God. You had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. Then once again, I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed, doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so arousing his anger. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, souls, and minds gathered in this place be acceptable unto thee, O God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. I really do just have a meditation tonight. I'm not, uh, Frank Beard always says I'm not going to preach, and then Frank Beard would go on to preach. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I, I'm, I, I'm hesitant to say I'm not going to preach, but this is more of a meditation than, a, than an actual sermon. But uh, several years ago, I was exiting a parking lot from a, um, from a business, and I was turning east onto a one-way street. It just so happened that there was a truck parked on the street, and so I couldn't see the cars coming from the west. Basically, there was this big blind spot, and I was um, um, driving out onto the road blindly. I couldn't see what was coming from the west. So I, as I slowly pulled out into the road, and I, I emphasize slowly because I really was going very, very slow, but as I was pulling out very slowly, still there was this big blind spot because of the truck parked in the street. As I pulled out, all of a sudden a car coming from the west um, entered my field of view, and I slammed on my brakes, 
and the lady in the car, she kind of swerved around me. And, and I'm no lip reader, <laughs> but, um, but I could tell the, the lady had a, a few colorful words for me. And what made me really feel bad was that this lady was probably in her mid to late 80s. And so at the time, I mean, she was old enough to be my grandmother. <laughs> now what made me really, really feel bad was that as she's swerving around me, and I kid you not, I remember this, but as she's swerving around me, she's got one hand over her heart like she's going to have a heart attack. And I'm just praying, oh, God, please let her not have a heart attack. You know, I'd hate to, you know, how do you say, tell people that, you know, what happened? Well, that would have been terrible, but she kept on going. But, you know, we all have different ways of expressing ourselves when we find, our, when we find ourselves in anxious moments or in difficult situations or in, um, or in tragedies. We just all have different ways of expressing ourselves. Some of us might use colorful words. Others of us might freeze up. In tense moments, and anxious moments, we, we might freeze up. While other people are, are the opposite, and they want to keep busy. And if, they, if they're not doing something that's driving them crazy, and so in anxious moments, in sacred moments, in stressful moments, they have to keep busy. They have to be doing something. And so all of us respond differently in these types of situations. Now in our text this morning from Deuteronomy, Moses comes down from the mountain with these tablets that God has given to him. And Moses is coming from a hot high point in his life. And he, he comes down, and he sees that the Israelites have made this golden calf with their gold. And basically, they're worshiping this, this false idol. And what is Moses' reaction? Well, first of all, what Moses does is he gets angry. And I, that's understandable. I think I would be angry as well. So his first reaction is anger, but his second reaction, if, if you remember from the text, is to fast. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, what Moses does is eats nothing. He drinks nothing. And why does he do this? Because of the people's sin. And just really quickly tonight, I just want to just give you a brief explanation of biblical fasting. And maybe encourage you to fast over these next 40 days of Lent. And, and Lent are those 40 days before Easter, not including Sundays. One of my favorite books on fasting is written by Scott McKnight, and it's entitled Fasting. But Scott McKnight defines fasting as something that is done as a response to a sacred moment. So you fast in response to a sacred moment. That sacred moment could be the death of a loved one. That sacred moment could be you losing your job. That sacred moment could be the sins of a nation or your personal individual sins. That great um, sacred moment could be disappointment. Disappointment over a broken relationship or it could be desperation. Maybe you find yourself in a valley. Maybe you find yourself spiritually in a dry place and you are seeking God and you want to hear God's voice and you want to see God's face, but everywhere you turn there is nothing and it's almost like Christ on the cross crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But according to, to Scott McKnight, fasting is a response to sacred moments in our lives. Now ultimately what fasting does is help us to focus upon God. So that we don't pay attention so much to the things of this world. And we pay attention to the things of God. And so fasting isn't about losing weight. Fasting isn't about making ourselves feel better. Fasting is a response to a sacred moment in our lives. And for Moses, that sacred moment was the sins of the people. Now, biblically speaking, fasting was refraining from, from food and, and from drink. You know, a lot of times during the, the season of Lent, we'll give up other things. We'll give up chocolate or we'll give up pop or we'll give up this or We'll give up that, and really, biblically, that's more of abstinence than, than fasting. And I just want to encourage you that if, if you don't have health concerns, and obviously everybody isn't called to fast um, because of medical reasons, and if you have a medical reason, I do want to encourage you to, to abstain from something. But if there isn't a medical reason, I want to encourage you to try fasting. Jesus fasted. The prophets fasted. 
Time and time again, God's people are called to fast. So maybe you want to fast um, this, this Lenten season. Obviously, I'm not asking you to fast for 40 days. <laughs> but maybe you want to fast on Friday in remembrance of Christ's crucifixion. Or maybe you want to fast on Saturdays in anticipation of the celebration we have on Sunday morning as we gather together to praise the resurrected Christ. Maybe you would like to fast on, on Wednesdays and Fridays, which the early Methodists did. And if you don't want to fast the entire day, pick, pick a meal to fast from. Or maybe you want to fast from the night before to the following lunch. Fasting. It draws us close to God. And so while you fast, I want to remind you to pray, to read God's word, to do good, to stay in love with God. And so really my, my question for all of us this evening is, you know, what's that sacred moment in our lives that we are facing? Is it, is it a sin? Is it a son or, or a daughter who has kind of gotten off path? Is it the death of a loved one that we just haven't been able to shake? Is it the loss of a job? What, what is the sacred moment in your life that is calling you to observe a holy fast and to draw closer to your God. What's God calling you to surrender unto him so that you can see and hear him more closely during this Lenten season? Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace, and, and we thank you for this the spiritual discipline of, of fasting. And so often we in the church don't do it, but we find it throughout the scriptures, even our Lord and our Savior fasted. And so, dear God, as we anticipate and wait for his second coming, as we face sacred moments in our lives, dear God, we pray that, um, that we might learn the power of fasting, that as we give up that, that food or that drink, that we may center ourselves upon you, that we might give to you all of ourselves and know that you are with us and that you sustain us, that you forgive us and that you call us to walk upon your path. Dear God, how, how do we respond to sacred moments in our life? And just maybe, just maybe fasting can help us heal from those times in which we walk through the valley of the shadow of death or through the dry desert points in our lives. Dear God, we thank you for these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together as we sing, I Surrender All.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gifts are we given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The ashes are a sign of our mortality and a sign that we need a Savior. They remind us that from the dust we were created into the dust of the earth, these bodies will one day return. But thanks be to God, who gives us everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and our Savior. In just a moment, we're going to be asking you to come forward to receive the imposition of ashes on your forehead, and we'll put that in the form of a cross. And it's a reminder, again, that even though these bodies will return to the dust, we do have the promise of resurrection, and we can have hope that Easter not too far away. And so as the Spirit leads you, we invite you to come and to receive the imposition of ashes. So whenever you're ready, we invite you to come. 